Yeah. So I love the part where you said, like, we all have stories and we're stuck in our stories. And so even when you started writing, you know, I believe I heard like your first book, like you were kind of stuck there, but then yeah. that made way to, to maybe you should talk to somebody. Right. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about that process. And you said um, the four people that, you know, those stories that you pulled out and then yours. So just tell, tell us a little bit about how you even develop those characters or, you know, who they are, really all that stuff. Right. So, yeah, I wasn't supposed to write. Maybe you should talk to someone. I had written a piece. I write for The Atlantic and um, I had written a piece called How to Land Your Kid in Therapy. And the subtitle was Why Our Obsession with Our Kids' Happiness Might Be Dooming Them to Unhappy Adulthoods. And that piece went viral in the most insane way. And, um, and publishers wanted me to write that book. And and I said, no, I didn't want to write a helicopter parenting book. I, I felt like there were so many books out there about overparenting. There was this great line in the New Yorker at the time that said another parenting, another overparenting book would just, you know, would just be cruel, <laughs> you know, because I think we want people to relax, not to be more obsessed with the whole parenting thing. And I was a parent, so I, I very much related to that. Um, and I was like in the throes of it at that time with a younger child. And um, and people thought I was nuts. You know, how can you turn down this? This I was. Uh, I'm also a single mother. So how can you turn down this extraordinary amount of money, more money than you've ever seen in your life, to write a book that you've already done all the research for because you wrote this very long piece about it and you had all the stuff that you couldn't fit into the article. So you've done most of the work and now you just have to put it into book form. And I couldn't get myself to do it. And I said, I'm really more interested in what's happening with the adults. And of course, we always say that research is me search, meaning whatever you're dealing with in your own life is probably what you're interested in. I wasn't so interested in what's going on with parents and kids. I was interested in what's going on with the adults. And what I was really doing was searching for meaning and purpose in a way that I felt, you know, I'd sort of been on this treadmill of, um, you know, doing various things in my life professionally. And I wanted to find the thing that was meaningful, not just to me, but would be meaningful to other people. And I didn't think a parenting book would do that for other people or for me. And so I said, I want to write about the adults. And they said, oh, you want to write a happiness book? And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Don't want to write a happiness book. But that's sort of what I got pigeonholed into. And I really feel like happiness as a byproduct of living our lives a certain way is what we all want. But happiness as the goal in and of itself is kind of a recipe for disaster. I think that happiness comes from meaning and purpose and connection and relationship. And so I wanted to write about that. And I thought, where do I see that? I see that in the therapy room every single day. And so I said, look, I, and it took me a while in, maybe you should talk to someone. I write the whole story of how I was supposed to be writing the happiness book. And it was literally making me depressed. So I was, which is ironic because it was a book about happiness and I called it the miserable depression inducing happiness book. And I kept going to therapy and saying, I can't write this book. And my agent says, I have to write this book. And if I don't write it, I'll never write another book. And being a writer is such a part of who I am. And I can't ruin my career. And because I didn't write the parenting book and and it was, it was this you know, months long process where finally I just said, screw it, I'm gonna cancel this book and I'm gonna write the book that I want to write. And, um, and that's what I did. And when, when I couldn't sell, maybe you should talk to someone. Like people said, no one's gonna read this book. And now of course, you know, over a million copies have been sold. I mean, it's, it's you know, been read by a lot of people. And I only say that because when you're told, you know, nobody's going to read this, nobody wants this, and you know, in the deepest recesses of your place of knowing inside, that it's the book you have to write or the thing you have to say, other people will come to it. And I didn't realize that at the time. And, and part of, you know, the interesting part of that is that because I included my own story, because I was going through something at the time, so I, I made myself the fifth patient. And a lot of people said, oh, well, you know, now they say, you know, weren't you worried about revealing so much about yourself, especially because you're a therapist? And I said, no, I thought nobody was going to read this. So I just kind of let it fly. Um, you know, and I think had I known, I maybe would have had the inclination to edit myself or make myself look a little more together or clean myself up a little bit. But I think the reason that so many people resonate with it is because I didn't clean myself up. Um, I think that they're, they're relating to the realness, the rawness, the authenticity. Um, and, and I think it's, it's really helped other people to, to be more open in their own lives too. 